Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the STD podcast. This week, we're going to do a dedicated Q&A episode uh, because we often don't get so many questions. So we're just going to go straight into questions this episode, um, get them all answered and um, do our thing. So uh, let's start with Trevor and I got the least questions. So we're just going to go over ours real quick and then we're going to go to Shimmy's. So yeah, Trevor. Mr. Instagram thing there got yeah, right. flooded. <laughs> well, Trevor, Popular. Trevor, it's because you... Trevor, it's because you have like 50 other questions that are not the podcast. People just ask them on there. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. Uh, so my first question was how to survive the last month of prep. Or hard diet or whatever. But uh, I feel like this one's going to be pretty easy because we've talked about this many a times. Yeah. yeah, I had a question like this, so I, I, I would like to answer or I have something to say about it as well. I had a question Mike. Dylan, why don't you why don't you lead us off? Cuz okay. you're never the one to lead off. Why don't you lead yeah, yeah. us off? Um so it was how to survive the last month of prep, right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, um well, how I basically deal with that. So you become like it becomes difficult to move and do just normal stuff. So I think it's really important to have a good kind of at least like morning and night routine to kind of get you going so just just habitual behaviors that you do a lot of the time it's like steps or you know getting outside like I like to do steps early in the morning so I'll just knock that out but for me especially because training is the thing that requires the most energy and it's probably one of your most difficult tasks that you're going to do throughout the day it's also you know up in the priority hierarchy when you're really close to a show or you're you know just very lean so uh, what I try to do is get to the gym as, as soon as possible. Try not to delay that. Now, I know there's people with restrictions and things like that. So if you, say, get off work early, uh, later in the evening, just getting straight to the gym, just trying not to delay that process, you're going to want to. You're going to get a feeling of like, if I wait, it might get better, which it often doesn't because you're just fatigued. And if anything, you're getting closer to the nighttime. You start getting more tired. You start being like, oh, I'll just do it in an hour, an hour. And eventually, you just don't do it, right? So um, try to, whatever your situation is, either have, um, be the, you know, you go to work, you go straight to the gym, or if you wake up in the morning and you go in the, in the morning, go straight to the gym in the morning. Try not to delay that process. And just remember that you're, it's, it's likely if you wait, you're not going to feel better. You're just going to be more tired, more fatigued. So putting that off is, is probably not a good idea in most cases. And then um, someone asked me how I dealt with training recently in a prep scenario. And training is like, there's, there's only so much you can do as far as preparedness for hard training. And really in that scenario, it's just, it's just doing it. It's simply just putting your head down, looking at your logbook and saying, okay, I got to do this. And just focusing on the set ahead of you. It can be really easy to be like, okay, I have this whole workout. You know, you're doing like 15, 20 sets. You're fucking exhausted to be like this, I can't do this right now. And you'll look at this task and it'll just kind of overwhelm you. Um, so I just really try to just break it up and like, okay, just put what you have into this set right now, breathe, think about, you know, um, your effort, think about your technique. And it really does help me to get through the, um, the, the session. And then also this is something Jimmy's talked about, but like, you also got to be cautious with your caffeine usage because you can get, especially four weeks out, you can get abusive. You can be like, okay, well, you know, this much caffeine makes me feel this way. So if I do more, I'm going to feel better. And then you just keep slamming caffeine. And as soon as you know what you're doing, you know, a gram, 1.5 grams of caffeine a day, and uh, you're not getting the effect you want out of it. And so now you're just anxious and fatigued, which is just like, not a great combo. So really, I think just leaning into it, and knowing that you're gonna have to push through, it's going to be hard, but just just getting to it and just doing it is the best advice I can give in that scenario. Sorry, I know I may have even given too much there, but that's uh, how I feel about that. Oh, good. Trevor, if I could summarize what Dylan just said, Dylan, I'm not shitting on you at all, but this what? is funny. It's like, yo, it's the last month of a diet. What's the best advice you could do? Dylan's advice? Just do it. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I don't know. Like, there's 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 yeah. little tricks you can do to like make it feel like to make it better. Like, I mean, but those are all the stuff people know what to do. Like, you know, you need to get enough sleep, right? You know, you need to eat, you know, be eating your your macros and stuff like that. Um, uh, and, and maybe you guys have more like 
like little details, like little tricks and, and things you can do. Yeah. But yeah, I think that they're they're ultimately that's what it came down to for me, at least in my last prep is it just was like, I would, tr I, I kind of have this thing where I try to like my brain. I mean, most people do is like you, your brain wants to avoid hard things. And so you kind of have to lean into it, especially there because there's no necessarily there's no relief. There's like, you know, like if you're like fatigued in off season, it's like, yeah, you can go home and eat some food and take a nap. Like, but if you're you know, you're, you're fatigued and you're four weeks out from a show. It's like, yeah, you could take a nap, but you'll still be fatigued when you wake up and you can only, feel like shit. exactly. You can only eat your macros and you can't eat more. So I guess that's what it comes down to for me, but. Trevor, you want to go next or you want me yeah, to jump? Okay. Go. Um, so the first one I would say is minimize outside stress. So be selfish the last month. Um, it's, you know, if you're down to this last month, especially if you're doing a show and you're in a prep, this is a time where, you know, it's okay to be a little selfish and it's okay to tell people, no, I'm not going to go out with you. You know, if your family is having a get together and you don't want to be around everyone picking out on tasty food that you can't eat, it's okay to say, no, I'm going to pass this time. You know, if people think you're an asshole, whatever, they think you're an asshole, but it's okay to be selfish sometimes. And this is the time it's probably good to do it. Um, and then the other one that I do is schedule everything. Write it down of when you are going to do it. Have as much of your day scheduled out as possible because if you have it scheduled, you're gonna do it or are more likely to at least. Whereas if your days are varied every single day of when you go to the gym, when you eat your meals, when you do your steps, when you do work, all these things, you're just making it much harder on yourself than you need to be. Have a consistent schedule day to day. My turn? Your turn. Okay. I've got a lot. Of course you and do. I'm going to break it up. I'm going to break it up into three. There's a training component here. How do you handle your training in, in the last month? How should you handle your nutrition in your last month and lifestyle? Really quick. Lifestyle? Huh? Really quick. I just have to say, I cannot talk on training because my my handling of training is not smart and not what I would recommend other people do because Shimmy knows exactly what I'd probably do. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> like, when it comes to lifestyle, I echo the sentiments of Trevor, but said in a probably more succinct way, just to be busy, be busy, be occupied, be busy, be occupied. Um, I don't know if I would say so much as a scheduling because your emotions are driven a lot higher in the last month of a diet. So um, you're probably more prone to anxiety. So being too regimented in your scheduling, if you miss something, it might mess with you mentally. So um, some people are like this, but um, being busy, not sitting home um, all the time, you know, occupying your brain, maybe picking up a hobby, picking up books. And if you have a good social circle, lean on them, hang out with your friends, be around them. You know, even if you're not as fun as usual, it doesn't matter. They're still going to like take your mind off of things. Can I, can I add as something to that? Your friends go out to the bar and drink beers and drink, eat chicken. As long as well, that's not yeah, that, gonna suck. And, and also you have friends that are, are, that you feel, and this is like, can be a whole nother argument and sorry to interrupt you, Shimmy, but I just wanted to put this in there is like people that you feel like that don't drain your energy. Like people you, you, who, who you enjoy being sure. around or positive. You know hundred. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Those those energy suckers, those blood suckers. Last cut them thing out you need. Or last thing life. you need when. Yeah, yeah. Last thing you need when you're fatigued and 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 really low in in body fat is other negativity yes, sucking sure. on you. Anyway, for sure. So so on the lifestyle on the lifestyle front, I would say be busy. On the uh, nutrition front, I've talked about this before. You may be hungry all the time, but everybody sort of has these windows where they are hungrier than others. Be mindful of that and try to bias as much of your food to the time where you are hungry. So if you're the kind of person that wakes up in the morning and you're not super hungry, don't put food there. If you're the kind of person that gets hungry midday or evening, look, we all know it's bad regardless, but still try to bias majority of your calories to the times that you are hungrier. It's going to be a little bit better. In addition to that, if you are drinking protein shakes, you might want to swap that out for actual chewable food at this point because it's just more filling. There's more, there's more involved. You get more out of it 
than simply smashing a protein shake. There are some people that don't drink protein shakes. It's whole food all the time. I would even bias to having a protein bar over a protein shake at this point in time, just because you'll get more, you'll get more out of it. There's more of a pleasure standpoint. It's a little bit more filling. Yeah. That's that. Uh, I want to add something to that real quick. And beyond just like, oh, the you know protein shake has whole food or something, you can do that with like literally everything. If you're having ground beef, eat steak instead. If yeah. you're shredded chicken, eat a grilled whole grilled chicken breast instead. The more you have to chew, the better off you'll be. Yep. And we can get into the nuances out of everything here. You know, you want to bias fruits that have a higher water volume so you can eat more of them. Berries come to mind. Watermelon. Watermelon. Um, apples because that requires a lot of chewing as well um you could even make the case foods that you need to work for more like a kiwi you have to peel it you have to you have to get in there um this is very nuanced and we're in the last month right pre-photo shoot pre-show these things all matter to this point as well i would actually push back on the oh we don't want to over caffeinate we don't want to whatever no this is the last month do everything do anything that will help you you want to have three diet drinks a day? This is the time. You want to have three, uh, I don't know, three, four pieces of gum a day? This is the time. Decaffeinated tea before you go to sleep, hot soups, especially consommes, chicken soups. These things are very low in calories. Miso soup. I'm giving you guys gems here. Yeah. These will make you feel full and have barely any calories. This is something to consider when it comes to caffeine, when it comes to pre-workout, hopefully you were judicious enough where you held back on pulling this lever because you didn't really need it. Now you need it. Don't hold back. Do it. Pull the lever. You have nothing. You have nothing more to, to leave on the field or excuse me. You have nothing more to hold back. Leave it all in the field, which segues perfectly into my, uh, my thoughts on training. Introduce more novelty in your training at this point in time. If a movement doesn't feel so good, if it takes too long to do, ergo, you know, pause squats, deficit deadlifts, if this is you, stiff-legged deadlifts, the all these kinds of movements, if they take 45 minutes to do with a lot of warming up, a big actually loaded component, and they're also like, like mentally, they take a lot, don't do them. Swap them out for something else. The novelty effect will be very, very important. You're only running this for a few weeks. Getting a pump and getting some level of soreness is pretty much a prime above all at this point. You beating the logbook and you hitting PRs a month out from a show is, is somewhat of a waste. Like you missed the window. That was before. That was the last two, three, four months of a diet. Not now. Now you have to land the plane. This is your job. So bias, I think, on more so the novelty aspect. If a movement feels amazing, keep it in. If movements don't feel that great, don't do them or swap them out for something else. Bias to more higher rep work, superset work, intensity techniques. This shouldn't take up all of your training, but if there was ever going to be a time where you were going to do a lot of this kind of stuff, that time is now. So think about that. Yeah. Um, I think that's what I got for right now. That's actually a really great point, especially the way you worded that of like, this is your last month. Do what it takes, like do what, do what you got to do. If that means you're pulling out squats and stuff and you're doing like leg extensions and lunges, because that's what you, that's what you can do that doesn't beat you up and take you 45 minutes to do you, but you can do a set, a super set of, you know, leg extensions to lunges to get a crazy quad pump. That's okay. I want to jump in here just for one second because I'm not taking issue with the language that you just used. I just want to give people a little bit of context to the phrase, it's the last month, do what you got to do. Because us as people that love training and love this whole entire experience, that can be taken another way. Do what you got to do means, oh, I got to hit this PR. I have to do these squats, even though I don't feel well. I, I need to do it. It's going to show on stage. I would push back on you, you know, let logic be your guide. I, if you are sub 10% body fat, you are super hypercaloric. You have a very high step count and your sleep is disrupted. This is not the time for PRs. It's not just as, yeah, as a whole. Yeah. If you're a month out, you're not, I don't even think you should really be aiming to push for PRs. Like if it happens, great. Sure. Rock out. But my point is, 
be very present during your warmups. Be very present when you're going through these movements because you might do your warmups and obviously you're paying attention to your logbook and you're like, okay, I'm still in the rep range, but I'm dropping reps week to week. And this movement, if I have five exercises to do in a session, this one movement, whatever it is, is taking me 45 minutes to do. Maybe I should stop doing it and just do something else. And remember, guys, you're in the last month. This is only for a few weeks. Then you'll be hypercaloric or you'll be isocaloric or something, and you can do whatever you want. At this point in time, get the pumps, be efficient with your training, accrue only as much fatigue as you need to, and be out. Yeah. Very much agree. Yeah. I, I like how we all kind of had different um, uh, answers for that. I think, and, and, and I want to say on my thing too, the reason why I was kind of oversimplified is I do think that that is probably the one case in which I'm very much so like, uh, it's important to be mindful. It's important to, um, what's the term I'm looking for? Um, I don't know. I guess I, I was just thinking that's the one scenario in which just doing it is, is the case. And I think that's kind of where you got to ultimately too, Shimmy. Um, one thing I did want to pivot off of is, um, this is actually very relevant. In the Team Full Realm Forum, I had mentioned something about not preserving strength. So so let me give you a little bit of background. Um, people focus on trying to preserve strength throughout a cut. And I was basically, someone was asking, should I do this? This um, uh, It was like a uh, online course or whatever. And I was like, oh, like, I don't know if I, uh, all of their training principles and philosophies I agree with. One of them was um, reducing volume to uphold strength on movements. And this is very uh, um, applicable to like contest prep or just getting dieting to get really lean. Dieting in general is, um, is strength a metric that we should be particularly concerned with when you're dieting? Or is that something that, and, and I'll give you my, my, answer to that was that strength is going to decline because of a number of factors we don't want acute performance going down week to week but if you're trying to squat what you squatted at the beginning of your cut at the end of your cut uh it's it's not it's not a good idea and reducing volume to do so you're basically doing a powerlifting peaking protocol yeah. not a bodybuilding prep i don't know what you guys have to say about that i just i felt it was I important to touch on that what was that? I had some thoughts, but Shimmy, do you want to go first? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, at a, uh, a first principles level, it's certainly a programming issue. If you have any experience and foresight in doing this kind of stuff, you would program higher rep things as you sort of progress into a diet. And I think right. that, if, I mean, if you've been here before, you know, um, higher rep ranges do have a tendency to stick in quite well during a diet. You don't usually see performance drop off in the 10 to 15 or 12 to 20 rep range for a majority of things, even when you get very lean. 5 to 10, 8 to 12 rep range is the one that usually takes a shit. So um, I think that keeping a strength is actually very important that you should maintain performance for majority of the diet. But I think at the end, if we were, if I was to do this in ratios, 75% of the diet, I think your strength should be kept in, in all rep ranges, to be very honest with you, or close. And that last end of the diet, um, I don't think that it's a, a really very important at all. But I think that if someone was an intelligent programmer, you know, they would start with biasing majority of their movements in the six to 10, eight to 12 rep range. Eventually that would become 10 to 15. Eventually that would become 10 to 15 and 12 to 20 with intensity techniques. So it would all sort of be ironed out in a pre-planned fashion. So like you would already know that this was the case. Like I wouldn't program flat dumbbell press in the six to 10 or eight to 12 rep range in my last mesocycle of dieting. Most likely I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. Um, preemptively. So I would probably do it in the 10 to 15 rep range and then maybe have a drop set or a superset with pushups at the end or something like that. Um, and I think that that will keep in really, really well. So um, I think that we can break this up a little bit too. If we're talking of like your 25% going to 15%, you probably shouldn't really see any strength loss. But if we're starting to get that below 10%, prep range, photo shoot range, things like that. That's where, like Shimmy said, 
you probably shouldn't lose strength for the majority of the diet. But towards the end, it's more likely to happen, particularly if you are using exercises that require a high degree of internal bracing. High axial loaded, actually ex fatiguing exercises, high axial load exercises that require a lot of internal bracing. You are a smaller person. You can, you can create less of a brace at that point naturally those are going to go down if you if you're trying to squat for you know eight five to eight reps when you're four weeks out from a show yeah it, you're going to be squatting less than you were you know peak off season you know 30 40 pounds heavier you're that much of a smaller person your core is smaller your trunk is smaller so there's some of it goes like shimmy said kind of into a programming as aspect Somebody that's smart with programming is going to likely know what exercises, what kind of exercises you are most likely going to run into those issues in and preemptively adjust the program to potentially remove them for at the period of time when you would likely see that strength loss, as well as adjusting the rep ranges. Because again, it's that lower rep range where you really need some oomph to produce the force, you're probably going to start losing that. But some of your ability to do higher reps, um, at least for a set or two, will maintain longer. And just remember that, you know, it, when you put pen to paper on this, if your 10 rep max on something is, let's say, 365, but then you go to a set of 15 with 285, if you were to, like, map that out in percentages, they're relatively the same. Yeah. relatively speaking you're just expressing your strength in a sort of a different way yeah but you know like it's relatively the same so That's if you're squatting if you're squatting let's say sets of five to eight with 275 with a pause and you go to the 10 to 15 range with uh with a pause and you're squatting 225 yes you're squatting 20 percent less but it's pretty much the same in terms of like relative effort or ba or your one RM percentage That's if you're going off of that. One RM is going to be roughly. The yeah. So, you know, you can also think about it like that. And, and when you do think about it like that, then it doesn't mess with you at all because it's pretty much like six of one, half a dozen. Yeah. Well, another way you can have it not mess with you is, um, uh, is, is making those, those variations preemptively. So actually, yeah. um, you know, variation. if, if you're keeping a movement in, like, hey, let's like a great one is like uh, a Smith incline, bump up the incline, implement a pause squats. You know, it's 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 working really well. It's jiving with you. Smith squats is one that I kept in most of the time. You know, I went from a regular Smith squat to a tempoed Smith squat to one with a pause um, and then eventually rotated it out. But like stuff like that, because because you will, especially towards the end, you know, you might lose um, your ability to express that that strength, like like Trevor mentioned. Um, and, and one thing I wanted to say is. If you were to so so if you were to start to experience performance decline, it's an overall programming issue, is what you're saying, right? And 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 one thing I, I want to say is that so in this example of this person, he would essentially pull back sets. I, I just think that personally, I think there are other proxies we use to, to to titrate volume, and like you mentioned, yeah, go ahead. I think so. One issue I have is when people are like oh, I'm losing performance, I'm going to drop my volume. But again, if you look, they're only losing performance on one exercise. Right. And sometimes they're not even losing performance. They're still in the range, but they're 15 pounds lighter in body weight. Like, dude, right, right. Like, you're not actually really losing performance. Yeah. Like, you need to look at it as a, like a whole, not in a single isolation of a single exercise. Because it might be that for a number of various reasons, you yes, you have lost performance on that one exercise. But if everything else for that muscle group has maintained performance, you're not losing performance. Right. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, to answer you the question directly, though, of um, do I think like about should we reduce volume to uh, maintain strength? I don't think we should reduce volume, but we have to be more careful with volume. Yes. Because yeah, yeah, that's, what, less. that's what I was going to say is be cautious about your progressions, right? Like when, yes. uh, when you might add two sets, maybe add one, 
when you might add 10 pounds, maybe add five Add a rep. You know what I mean? Be, be a little bit more cautious because, because that's another way you could run into that issue is if you're trying to make aggressive, uh, uh adjustments in volume via your, you know, yeah, repetitions but... or through your sets, you're going to hit walls quicker. Yeah. I would actually go so far as to, especially when you're deep into a diet, you should really only raise volume when you're very clearly missing out. Like when, when the stimulus is like just very subpar, if you're getting really solid pumps and like pretty good fatigue in the muscle, why are we raising volume? And and like, what would that be contrary to like massing? Well, in massing and in massing, you can be a little bit more liberal with your, your volume because your adaptations are going to come quicker. So you're so like, oh, like, I'm yeah, not getting max pump. Maybe I could maybe add. You got like pretty good pumps and massing, but you can probably still add a set. If you're getting pretty good pumps when you're a month out, maybe you don't need to add a set. If you're getting no pumps, yeah, maybe add a set in that case. But see, you just move that bar a little bit. And also remember, trainee or anybody listening, that there are methods of adding volume that don't require actually adding sets. Yes, there are. You know? So you can always do like, you know, if you're progressing through a diet and you want to add volume, you think you can recover, but like you're not sure, dude, add a drop set, add a, an ISO hold for time, add a, um, a, 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 yeah, some sort of little superset with a body weight or really lightweight. This is like another sneaky way that you can increase volume. It's obviously gets done really fast and you don't have anything to worry about going through the uh, volume accumul accumulation via straight set additions is cool in the beginning of a diet, but later on, most of your sets are probably going to end up being more static than you're used to. And you'll derive your drive volume accumulations through the addition of intensity techniques. Hope yep. that makes sense. Yeah, yep. that makes a lot of sense. That's smart. Trevor, do you have another question? Sorry, I didn't mean to go off on that. Uh, yeah, the other question that. was um, comparing four to one to five to one to six to one mesocycles. Is one better than the other? I assume is the question. It just said thoughts on. So they're all good, and it's really just based on what you can handle. Yep. And the only way that you'll and the only way that you'll know is when you know. It, it is none of them, unless we're talking the extremes, there is really no difference. If you're doing a one to one or a two to one accumulation of deload paradigm, you should probably make, make some adjustments. If you're doing an eight to one, nine to one, 10 to one mesocycle, you can probably train a little harder early on. But that middle range, it's probably all about even it's just what you can handle. And there's a lot of individual factors that's going to make up that variation. Yeah, I think um, you can, and, and there are, there are special circumstances, like, like you mentioned, like consolidating them to fit into a macro cycle or to meet some sort of deadline, but you're still sticking around that average. And in most cases you're just auto-regulating. Yeah. I think like, like, okay, uh, real quick. Uh, if someone was a beginner, and they're or, or they're just trying to figure out what their accumulation deload paradigm is, really quick. Like, are they? Are you? Oh, wait, 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 wait. Are are they a beginner, full on beginner? Like, sorry, maybe they're. This is something I get a lot. Is like maybe they're newer to this type of training. Like, oh, like deloading. They maybe have been training for a while, but like they don't. They've never like deloaded on a consistent basis. But they want to find out what their paradigm. Because this is what someone will come to me and I'll be like, you know, maybe they they have a decent amount of muscle or maybe intermediate. Uh, you know, how would we figure out a, 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 a accumulate, you know, accumulation to deload paradigm? Well, Bullet you notes. Just keep going until you can't progress. Yeah. Or yeah. in most cases, keep going until you have sleep disturbances, because that's for most people, some sleep disturbances and excessive fatigue happen before you actually, right before you actually progress. Yeah, I noticed desire to train starts to yeah. starts to teeter. Desire to train, uh, sleep disturbances, uh, that excessive fatigue kind of falls in the desire to train where you're just like, you're very listless. You just don't want to do anything and don't seem to care about anything. 
that's probably that's a good sign that you know hey, I should probably finish this week out and deload. And for most people, those things are going to happen before an actual like systemic decrease in performance. Jimmy, <laughs> no. we're just waiting for for his uh nod of approval. Okay, I'm good. I'm good. Cool, cool. Let's see. Um, okay. Correlation between volume and DOMS was the question I got. Is there a correlation between volume and DOMS? Yes. I mean, I, I don't know if I quite understand the question. Correct. Me neither. I guess I like, was thinking about it yes. earlier. <laughs> yes. If yes. you do more yes, volume sir. closer to failure, are you more likely to get more sore? Yes. If you do less volume, are you likely going to get less sore? Possibly. I don't. I don't know what what you. What want. what I was going to say I is want. like, what 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 may be the cause of DOMS for somebody? It's just training closer to failure with more volume. I and I ask this because I don't experience DOMS like ever. So some people just don't. There's a lot of genetic factors too. You don't get sore, Dylan. Very rarely. It's obnoxious. His recovery cap capabilities are kind of ridiculous. Interesting. I can't remember the last time I got DOMS for sure. <laughs> I get DOMS like six hours after I finish training. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I get I most, well. of my, most of my body parts. I mean, now at the end, like, I don't get as much soreness. I basically just get like like tired, but yeah. um, I still and get you, some soreness. And you tend to experience more of that towards the end of an accumulation closer to failure at your higher points. Is that somewhat safe no. to say? Or... No, no. No, uh, I don't think that's the case. Because okay. Remember, remember, novelty is a thing. You're also resensitizing to volume in an acute sense from your deload. So I actually think that your soreness should be relatively similar throughout um, and you're sort of like chasing the dragon, so to speak. Yeah. So like when you start a mesocycle, yeah. you have a moderate level of soreness. But if you were to keep that volume and keep that effort, that soreness would abate. So you're actually just looking for that soreness or maybe for it to compound marginally. Um, but it, it's not like you're starting with just a little bit and then you're dying at the yeah. end, at least not for me. I don't think you yeah. should ever be crippled sore. No. Effective programming does not mean you're crippled sore. Yeah. Um, I also, I've talked about this before. I think that we need to change the way we think about DOMS because some people just largely in general, and for most people, there are a handful of muscle groups that rarely get sore. But what we will find is that they have general fatigue. And we use DOMS simply as a proxy of recovery of the muscle. Because we know as DOMS increases, your force production decreases. Well, it's the same thing if if you're you're dealt that like they never get sore. Okay. But when you go to reach to a high shelf, you're like, oh God, my arm feels heavy. It's still fatigue. Mm -hmm. It's still a, pro a proxy of recovery. So yeah. I think that just using like we needed, I think a little different on like on how we describe doms or how people use doms you, if you're constantly just tracing feeling like you know your muscles got run over by a truck i mean you're shit go get run over by a truck and there you go yeah right it's probably suboptimal if you're debilitatingly sore yeah time. yep um quick injury question um, I someone asked about a specific injury, which it's very difficult to give. So Dan, you said you didn't get questions. You did get I questions. Got two, I got two. It's my two questions. We both got two. We got two. I feel like we've taken a long time to answer two questions. Yes, we that's actually our, have. That's our stick. Do we, when do we well, not? Four take, total. Like, yeah. And I, I had an important caveat. You had some important stuff to add in. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, you're right. Uh, <laughs> okay, so it's about a specific injury. It's how to heal a groin strain. Uh, they want to do it ASAP, which I think already is kind of like, eh. but I think in general, how would you maybe approach just an, an injury or maybe even a groin strain um, specifically? Again, it's difficult to give specific recommendations for this person asking. Um, okay. So, so, this is, so this, is under, 
Yeah. So this is under the supposition that they've already gone to their doctor. They've already done PT. They said, all right, you're cleared. You're good. Rehab it any way you want. Okay. We've established that. They've come to me. They've come to Trevor. They've come to Dylan. They say, help me. All right. First order of business, stop doing anything that bothers you. Second order of business, train everything else in your body hard to stimulate adequate blood flow. Third order of business, take the muscle group through a pain-free range of motion, whatever that looks like for you. Train it in the high, the, the, the rep range that it doesn't bother you and that you can actually progress on and stay completely in that rep range and progress. And then over time, over the course of likely months, that rep range will go from whatever, maybe the 20 to 30 or 20 to 25 rep range. And it will eventually walk down from the 25 to 30, the 20 to 25, the 15 to 20, the 10 to 15. And now look at that. We're back in the 10 to 15 rep range training with decent range of motion and you're probably all healed. And obviously I just made that really simple. I mean, that's probably a multi-month process, but that's the way I would do it. One, one thing I want to add is and just uh, I literally had a client that had shoulder and knee surgery, and that's literally like the last six to eight months of our programming has been walking through that progression. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one thing I want to add to that is is just relative effort. And you may train it a little bit further from failure for a period of time. Yeah. Especially, especially early on. That may be the case. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's a, it's yeah. the exact same thing I did with, um, I don't know if you guys have seen Connor on my story recently. He's getting ready for a show, but he had two patella terrors. Off yeah, the bone. and we did the exact same and i started with occlusion ish some of that i was throwing in there at the beginning but then it was higher rep ranges further from failure and then we walked him back and then he was totally fine so, so that's all it is um just for shits and giggles i'll give you guys the um the jujitsu method of dealing with injuries take a bunch of bpc and gh and ignore it <laughs> yep I think that's uh, uh, interestingly enough. And yeah. everybody who's listening, don't worry about it. I don't know what BPC is either. <laughs> um, we yeah, we had like, a rash of injuries early this year, and like everyone's like, Trevor, where do I get BPC and GH? And I'm like, how did I become the drug guy at the gym? It's <laughs> <laughs> funny. You just hand them out like good goodie bags, BPC and GH. Yeah, right. Because with your jujitsu, your jujitsu membership comes with a kit of GH and a, and a BPC. Yeah, we should sell BPC at the gym. I mean, shit. Make a lot of money. Right. Up at the front desk. Um, yeah. Cool. Shimmy, you had a lot of questions. What are some yeah. really good ones that you want to start with? We'll get to like what is two. your best? What is your best diet food, aka that fill you up from JI? Piro, Jipiro. Shimmy, I've got a lot of cool things to say about this, and I'm going to give you ones that you may not have considered. So here we go. You are going to go on your cereal aisle, and you are going to go to the cereal bar section, and you are going to start looking at the macros of a lot of these cereal and fiber bars because there are tons of bars made by Fiber One, Kellogg's, and Nature Valley. If you're in the U.S., if you're in Canada, you know them. If you're not in the U.S. or Canada, I'm sorry, Google them, but you probably have versions for yourself. There are tons of little cereal bars, meal bars that are low in fat, low to moderate in carbs, and very high in fiber. These things are great, and they're not expensive either. They're cool to add to some of your meals. That's number one. Number two, hot soup. I mentioned it before. Specifically, soups that are um, broth-based. And that are not cream based. So uh, tomato tomato soup is cool. Chicken soup, miso soup, udon, um, and there are many others. Soups are great. Hot liquids in general. Decaffeinated tea before you go to sleep is a great one, especially if you're the kind of person that only that gets their last meal <laughs> last meal at seven thirty or eight p.m. But you don't go to bed till ten or eleven, and you're still hungry. Having something like that, it, it will actually keep you fuller. And you may not have considered it. So decaffeinated tea, that's very important, especially as you progress into a diet because you don't want to have any caffeine at all before you go to sleep, even if it's marginal, even if it's 30, 40 milligrams. Like why roll the dice? Just, just don't. Um, so there's that. You want to pick fruits that have a very high water content. I mentioned this earlier because you can have a large bolus of them 
and they're not a lot of calories. So you might want to stay away from things like bananas. You might want to opt for things like berries and melons and watermelons and things like apples that also require a lot of chewing. This is a good idea. Um, in addition, if you're the kind of person that struggles with hunger, stop drinking protein shakes, opt for whole food. This is another one to consider. I'm the kind of person where I like to drink one to two protein shakes a day, pretty much every day. As I progress in a diet, those protein shakes become protein bars. And sometimes those protein bars just become regular whole food meals of beef, chicken, and fish. And um, it just makes things a little bit easier. Uh, what are some other foods that I like? Um, when you're cooking your proteins in a pan, chicken, fish, beef, whatever, cook it with a vegetable of your choosing. This will increase the volume of the meal and it will make the illusion that your meal is bigger and that you're eating more. When you're measuring this stuff out on your scale, make sure that you note that. If you cut up a whole onion and you put that in there with a pound and a half of ground beef, when you're measuring out your six ounces of cooked ground beef, you might not want to measure six ounces on your scale because there's a lot of onion in there too. Um, so this is just something super nuanced, but like, remember that. Baked beans are a renaissance food for me during this diet. Growing up, I thought baked beans were fine. I don't eat pork, so I buy the vegetarian one from Bush's. If anybody here is in America, you're curious, Bush's baked beans. Um, they have two different kinds. They have a vegetarian one that's called vegetarian and one that's like hickory smoke that's also vegetarian. What's up, Dr. Half a Pepper? cup. What? Jorge and I found Dr. Pepper when we were in Vegas and we tried it. It's Dr. Pepper baked beans. Pepper beans. Oh, oh, cool. Never... Cool. Not so so half a cup of Bush's baked beans have zero grams of fat, 30 grams of carbs, five grams of fiber, and about seven grams of protein. I mean, if you're looking for a diet food, look no further. And in addition to that, and I'm giving you a two for here, when you're meal prepping, all you need to do is take your protein, cook it, add a little bit of salt, and that's it. And then cut it up and toss it in with your baked beans because the baked beans already have a sauce that's quite good. You don't have to do anything. You just mix it all together and it tastes good, like objectively good, not bodybuilder good, actually good. <laughs> um, so baked beans, total hack, total, total hack. Um, and then the usual suspects, potatoes, oatmeal, um, yogurt. This is great. And that's all I got, but that's a lot. <laughs> All right, I have a few. So um, I'm going to speak to all of the former fatties here. Yeah, yeah, that's not me, guys. Obviously, any, any former fatty that's like Shimmy is telling you, like, yeah, eat cereal bars when you're dieting. You're like, are you a fucking idiot? I'm going to eat the whole box. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, popcorn. Uh, the, uh -huh. the low fat microwave ones or just get an air popper and pop your own. You can like two servings of popcorn is like 160 calories and it's a gigantic bowl full that's gonna take you 20 minutes to sit and eat. Amazing, amazing diet food. Like underrated. I don't know why more people don't do it. Bodybuilders that don't do it are stupid. It's because you have to really search out the low fat option. It's not that easy to find. Yeah, not if you get an air popper. You can get an air popper for 20 bucks on Amazon. You can just buy kernels at any store. Yeah, but like now this is a whole other step. Like you're not only are you telling me this food that I need to find, now you're telling you, me that I need to buy a very seen, specific you've seen the crazy ass thing do when they're dieting. But spending $20 on an air popper is not that bad. I bought an ice cream maker, Shimmy. I bought an ice That's cream the next maker. thing I was going to say. <laughs> buy you a Ninja Creamy. And then you can make any of your uh, protein shakes into pints of ice cream. So again, this I've never I've never tried this. It's oh, amazing. Yeah. You can make it, it you basically 200 calories for a pint of ice cream that takes you 15 minutes to eat. It's incredible. You can turn any like it, where you have a protein shake, you make an ice cream instead. Way more filling, way more satisfying. It's going to keep you fuller longer and it's going to give you something to do. 
versus you down a shake in five seconds, eating ice cream is going to take you some time. When you're dieting and when you're hungry, that cannot be understated. So those are my uh, former fatty options. Yes, I'm with the Ninja. The Kool rest guy. I can agree with you. I told a few oh, clients about that. Question. Yeah, go ahead. And cereal. Bran flakes. The shit's got like 12 grams of fiber per serving and you eat it dry. Do not put milk in it. It's not going to be the best thing, but it's going to give you something crunchy to eat. And it's going to have a shit ton of fiber. So you guys mentioned right. most of the foods. So I'm just going to go over some general things, um, some general things that I pay attention to, to select foods. First and foremost, Shimmy said um, uh, about the food appearing bigger. You can also use smaller um, uh, cutlery, smaller plates as well. Uh, your brain that's perceives good. that you're eating more because it looks at the ratio of the food to the plate. Um, so that's a good hack. Uh, an actual specific food I forgot to mention is uh, just big salads, like just romaine, tomato, whatever you want. Really large volume um, for not a lot of that, calories. So. And and then one other thing I'm doing if I'm selecting foods is I look at, I'll be like, I'll go into the log and I'll log the food and I'll look at how many calories it is and compare that to the actual volume in grams. And I can't remember what the ratio that I normally. That's a big for. rate. Yeah, yeah. Um, because then it kind of then it you kind of make this like, is this food necessarily worth it? Obviously, like you kind of weigh that against your appetite as well. Uh, but I try to just generally select foods that have lower amounts of calories for higher amounts of gram weight on a scale. And you can even just go into go into your logging app, log a cup of rice, and then log a cup of potatoes, and you can literally it's half the calories for the same volume of food. So that's a really good that's, one to like visually compare. That's actually called volumetrics eating. Oh, okay. And uh, you can literally, you can go through a diet largely like that where you maintain the size of your meals and change your yeah. food selection. Right. Generally speaking, when but you're dieting. I do have thoughts on that, that sometime, not this podcast, because it's going to take a whole podcast. I want to get deep dive on Yeah, that. yeah, definitely. We'll save it for next time for sure. I think there are drawbacks because it can also fall into uh, people who are doing intuitive eating. Uh, and then they, uh, to some degree, like that's what a, a strategy that people who intuitively eat use, but obviously that's not for physique enhancement. That's a yeah. completely other subject. Anyway, Shimmy, you got more questions for us? Hans, is getting a pump essential? Honestly, at this point, yes, it is. Agreed. And besides that, you know what Arnold said. Yes, I know what he said. And so do you, listener. You do? Yes. Classic, get this one all the time. Does the deadlift count towards weekly set count for the back? Or no stretch contraction, no count? No woman, no cry. I'm disregarding the last part because it doesn't make any goddamn sense. So does the deadlift count towards weekly set count for the back? It can. It, it it really is dependent upon the soreness that you personally derive. If your glutes get fucked up, glutes. If your lower back gets fucked up, yes. If your upper back gets fucked up, yes. It's different strokes for different folks on this one. Two things. One, understand that volume counting is largely something we do arbitrarily. There's a thousand different ways we could track volume and count set volume. Ultimately, the stimulus that you're getting is what you should use as your guiding post. So exactly like Shimmy said, what gets fucked up, that's what you track it to. Two, have either of you ever gotten sore rear delts from doing deadlifts? Yep. It's like the most sore my rear delts ever get. Yep, that's definitely it's definitely happened. The more narrow of a grip that I take, the more my upper back generally gets disrupted in Not all even like upper back as a whole, but like rear delts in particular, like crippled sore. No, not crippled, but sore, like, yes. Like literally it affects my rowing just to here because my my rear delts will cramp. No, that I've not experienced. It, yeah, it's weird. It's weird. I know. I don't know if my mm -hmm. rear delts have ever gotten sore. <laughs> yeah. Um Okay. Yeah, go ahead. 
Okay. Um, so I'm going to say it the way they did, and then I'll rephrase it to normal language. Bigger athletes, more training years. Mesocycle could, should be shorter. That's all they said. So, you know, said differently, if you are a uh, – do, does the bigger you are and the more training experience you have dictate the length of your mesocycle? And um, in some parts, yes. In other parts, not so much. So if you're a bigger person, um, you get disrupted from more. Yes, that's definitely a thing. However, you can, of course, arbitrarily extend mesocycles however you want to. So... Um, Typically, though, most people fall in that four to six to one accumulation. And that's what we pretty much <laughs> all recommend. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I will say you, via auto regulation, you may end up with a shorter accumulation phase just due to the fact that your, your, um, your window of effective volume does condense as you become more yeah. experienced. So you may end up you can you can extend that that out and it's going to be less uh, aggressive progressions but you know it's going to likely condense and you can only get away with effective training for shorter periods of time yeah so There's other I, ways for to one, that that too. I very specifically plan for it i cannot go past a four to one interesting anymore mm -hmm. anymore a five to one i may get one fresh off like an active rest but that's about it. Or like uh, if I take a maintenance phase, I may get one. But after that, four to one is all I can handle. Um, I just get too fucked up. Um, that, that's largely how you should do it. But I will say m m most of the time you will find that bigger and specifically stronger people will accumulate fatigue faster than smaller, weaker people. I got another good question here. When ending a mini cut, should one maintain first at new maintenance or just start bulking as soon as possible? This is a good one, and, but I still think there's a very specific answer to it. Please. You Dylan? should maintain your new body weight in your deload from the mini cut. And then you should probably get back to massing. Especially if that's what you were you were massing and you mini cut it to continue to potentiate the mass, just get back to massing. Right. Yeah. Remember why you did a mini cut, right? You did a mini cut to potentiate further massing, not to get lean and hang out there, right? So yep. if you wanted to get lean, then you need a conventional cut. But if you want to potentiate, and you'll get lean, like I don't want to say that you won't, you'll get leaner, but you want to get back to massing. And I think some people come out of it like, I just did a cut, so I don't want to put on any more fat. And it's like, well, no, you're massing. Like, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to potentiate your hunger. It's aggressive. And you want to be productive at massing. So, yeah, that's what I have to say about that. Cool. Uh, how many more questions would you like? Two, three, one? Depends, depends on how long they take. You know us. Okay. Favorite pre or post workout meals and snacks? Okay. Okay. Uh, no, I'm here for this. Yeah. I mean, this this might be the last one because we might be here for a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Dylan, you go first. No, oh, great. I know Trevor and I are going to say more than you. So you go yeah, first. Yeah, most definitely. Well, yeah. uh, Shimmy got me on the Honey Checks uh, hype. That is like Let's one go. of my favorite, so favorite cereals so now. I just don't get tired of it because it's just not too sweet. It's like the perfect amount of sweetness. So that post workout by far one of my favorites. Um, I also this off season like um, just getting a slushy, especially as it's getting hot. Going to the gas station, very simple, uh, and I like candy. So any sour candy, it's my shit. That's pretty much it for me. <laughs> Although I have to be careful. Like I can only buy the amount I'm going to eat because if there's any other hanging out in my house, I will eat it. So I get a family size bag, I will eat the family size bag. So I have to be like cautious about buying individual size snacks. That's funny. Trevor, what about uh, you? Yeah, so Shimmy also got me on the Honey Nut Decks. That stuff is potentially the best massing cereal ever because it really, like, 
everyone's like, oh yeah, fruity pebbles, cocoa pebbles, all this stuff, and like you, at some point you're like, I can't eat any more sugar. Yeah. But the honey nut checks are just right. We're like, this is good, but it's not making me gag because it's so sweet. <laughs> Anybody listening to this podcast, if you have honey checks, you do it and you post about it and you tag me in it. Okay. Yeah. Done. Thank We've said it. So those are amazing. Um, bagels. Bagels and jam have been my go-to post-workout lately. Um, either cinnamon raisin or just plain toast them, put some strawberry, peach preserve, orange marmalade, something on there. Amazing. It is easily become one of my favorite things. Pre-workout, I actually like oats that um, mix a little cocoa powder in there and a little bit of instant coffee. Okay. And, yeah. coffee yeah. Okay. Oats. And a little caffeine. Like going. It. Wasn't expecting yeah. that. It's, it's delicious. That is like my go-to pre-workout. I want to try that. I like it's, that. It's That's really cool. good. Yeah. I, um, I forgot one. Those are probably my go-tos. The one thing I've been doing recently is, is homemade bread. That is, oh, if you're God. having trouble at all, fresh bread is like, you, I could literally eat a whole loaf. So that is. A, yeah, it's fresh a bread. There's nothing like it. Mm -hmm. So um, if I had it my way, I would train first thing in the morning. So I actually don't have a pre-workout meal. I have uh, two scoops of Dimatize ISO 100 hydrolyzed whey with my creatine. And then I have anywhere from 20 to 40 grams of carbs in the form of Gatorade while I train. In a perfect world, this is all I would have pre-workout. That does me right. It's good enough for me. So I sort of dropped the ball in the favorite pre-workout department. If I had to choose something, it would be a very lame answer. I would just say I like a serving of fruit before I train. That's it. Serving of fruit and a protein shake or a protein bar, that's good enough for me. 100% with you. I'm with you. Okay. Now, in the post-workout sphere, I'm here for kids' cereal for some time. Now, honey checks are great. I've got another one for my two co-hosts tonight. And anybody else listening, and I've mentioned it before, Honey O's are the best cereal of life that exists. I actually order those because they are not at the Walmart. Right? <laughs> so Honey O's are God tier, Super Saiyan Blue, Men in Black 3, uh, Rush Hour 4, whatever you want to call it, this is that. Honey O's are the shiznit. Not Popeye's, Honey O's. Kid cereal post-workout's great. Chocolate milk post-workout is great. But really, I'll tell you, my favorite thing to do post-workout is as long as it's tracked, I fit in whatever junk food I want. Yeah. So I'll as long as it's tracked, I'll have cookies. I would have a <coughs> brownie. I would have croissants and jam. Um, as long as it's tracked. And obviously, like, if we're talking about post-workout meals, like we're talking about massing because dieting, no and maintenance, who cares? So like when you're in mass mode, you can eat pretty much whatever you want. So if I'm going to have any junk food, I am going to bias it to my post-workout time where in theory, we don't know, in theory, you're a bit more efficient. Your muscles might suck up the nutrients just a little bit more and bias it to fat just a little bit less. So, you know, whatever it is, like on paper, right, we always say, and mind you guys, I'm not enhanced. So this doesn't matter to me as much about having super low fats and super high carb and super high protein, fast digesting. Um, you know, I sung those lyrics for years. Great songs. Sure. But I'll tell you, like, if I want pizza, I'm having it after I train. If I want sushi, I'm having it after I train. Um, but I'll always have a protein shake. So the protein shake goes without saying. I'll always have a 25 to 50 gram protein shake, usually within 30 minutes to an hour of training. And then it's open season for everything yeah. else for that one meal. And I that's find a, that I'm just able to assimilate that food a little bit more. That's a good strategy though, especially if you like go out and eat or something. A lot of the time the pro protein portions are smaller. So having a shake yeah. just kind of uh, hedges your bets that you're going to get enough protein. 
Um, thousand percent. And then you, can, exactly. then you can focus on the tasty food. I do that yeah. a lot when I am like when we're going out to eat or something. Yeah, it will be. Oftentimes after a workout, uh, you know, I have the benef- benefit where I work out twice a day, so I have like multiple post workout <laughs> sessions. Um, but I do agree that that is a great time to do it because, like you said, in theory, yeah, it, you're going to have a little bit more nutrient sensitivity in the muscle cell potentially. And you know what? If you're going to eat it anyway, you might as well hedge your bets. 100%. Because you're going to um, eat it anyway. And and I will say, if you're training twice a day, it may be a little bit more important for that first post-workout just to um, replenish for the, the, lower the evening session. Yeah. But, the but evening I, I, session. Like, I like what Shimmy said earlier about um, adjusting, a, this is kind of backtracking a little bit, adjusting your nutrients based on hunger during a diet and it's going in between massing and dieting, but adjusting it based on hunger during a diet, because I feel like the post-workout as adherence is probably more important in the diet than the post-workout anabolic window. Um, so I would generally worry more about like, what, what can I, how can I adjust my macros that I'm getting multiple protein feedings and I am, you know, what will help me to be the most adherent. And then I'll maybe put some carbs or something around the workout um, but yeah, that's, I, I just wanted to throw that in there. I want to add something on top of that. That's really quick. That's going to sound at face value blasphemous to anyone that's like a nutrient timing zealot, but it's okay. Hear me out. When you train, especially when you're dieting, chances are you had caffeine. This numbs your appetite. You may or may not have had carbs while you're training that numbs your appetite. Training in itself for many people, myself included, has a hunger numbing effect. When you're done training, if you're not hungry, don't eat yet. Wait, wait until you are hungry. Even if it's an hour or an hour and a half where you could just drink water and you're just, you know what I mean? You just feel good because you're still off of your caffeine buzz. Like do that. And then your hunger will hit but you've already bought yourself so much time. So you're likely going to have a decent sized meal, even if you're deep into a diet. This is not advice that you'd hear that a lot of people would tell you. But if you think about it logically, it's a good idea. Uh, I have one yeah. caveat to that. Oh, good. I do that, except I do have a shake after I work out about 30 minutes later. Because especially for legs and especially in the summer, training will oftentimes want my appetite for hours yeah so i at least have a shake after training but then i generally don't eat again for another four or five hours because they're like that especially when it, i'm training like legs or back yeah in the heat, it just completely decimates my hunger yeah yeah uh one thing to put numbers on it too uh for what shimmy had said i think for beginners some of the numbers for muscle protein synthesis being elevated post-workout this is what the anabolic window is to some degree is like 72 hours. Yeah. It's so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then like for advanced people, it condenses a little bit four to six still though. So it's like, yeah, it's, even when you're advanced, it's pretty, it's still, yeah, it's not 30 minutes. Um, in most cases, not an hour. So don't freak out. Like I used to, if you can't eat immediately after you train. Your whole workout was wasted, Dylan. Exactly. <laughs> Oh, so the stress that that caused me at one point was insane. And I want to, uh, I'll circle back to what I was saying about, you know, having some fun food or some junk food after you're done working out. I mean, look, from a bro standpoint, I mean, what is more pleasurable in this game than like having a hard workout, killing yourself, and then having like an amazing meal afterwards? Like, this is part of the thing. Oh, 100%. You know what I mean? Like, no, I, uh... Bodybuilding culture 101. It, yeah, it, like if you uh, go and you have your hard ass workout, you're like, no, I need to go have like my, uh, I don't know, my sugar powder and then my protein shake. Like, man, you can, sure you can, but I think there's like more life quality that you're missing out on. <laughs> so uh, we used to go to Denny's, and Denny's sadly has gotten rid of this, but they yeah, had it's... all you can eat pancakes for four dollars. Yep. Yeah, I mean, right? R.I.P. John Meadows. Like, that's the thing. It's I, part of- I, I did that as a programming. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, Trevor. Most I ever uh, ate was 26 pancakes. Jesus Christ. Wow. 
Um, yeah, I did that. Uh, it's funny because I worked with a guy under John Meadows, and the way he had me load one time was with pancakes. Yeah, all pancakes. you can eat as any. So that's what it was. Yeah. That's funny. Thing is with me, man, I'm not a pancakes guy. I like French toast, and French toast is high fat, so like it, it doesn't work. Uh, well, I mean, macro friendly French toast at home, I guess, is not made for you. But I don't do that. You don't. I'm super so I'm um and maybe we'll close with this. I don't know. Um, I'm super big on this. Like, I don't like healthifying food that shouldn't be healthified. Like, if you're gonna eat healthy food, eat healthy food. If you're gonna have junk food, have junk food. Don't try to split the difference because then you just get end up getting the short end of the stick of both. Yeah, yeah. protein cookies, protein, low fat cheesecakes, even though I don't like cheesecake. Um, yeah, fucking the cauliflower pizza. The time investment for me yeah. usually just isn't worth it. I'd just rather eat my whatever food if I'm dieting. Give me a fucking chicken, chicken, potatoes, and vegetables, and yeah, you know, maybe I'll the way. Yeah, right, right. I'm with or you. Or not. Or, you know, it, chances are if you're eating something out of a box, you have the macros there. If you really want it, just eat it. And then, you know, if you're on a diet, like, accept that that was a bad idea and you're going to be hungry. <laughs> yeah. Once you're passing, then, like, who cares? But if I'm massing, it's like, yeah, if I'm massing, what? it's much easier because we can have those a couple times a week. And honestly, I get to where I just don't really crave them. Right. Right. You you you, you tend to put them on a pedestal when you're dieting. And then you have them. You. What was that? I said, eventually, when you're massing, you get to the point where you're like, oh, what, you, what, what are you going to eat? And you're like, nothing. Really, that's what I want. That's what I want my free meal to be is to not eat a meal. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. We we tend to uh like put the the super tasty foods on a pedestal when we're dieting, and then you're masking. You realize like, oh, it just wasn't as good as I imagined it to be. Uh, so it's a good opportunity. Isn't to that be life, like, huh? Yeah. Isn't that yeah, just, just like all of life? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. But uh, Dylan has Tan been sending you food porn? Constantly? Oh yes, hundred <laughs> percent. Okay, he yeah. So food porn from like here in Arizona. He's like, I'm coming out to eat food. With you. I'm like, yeah. Let's do it. He told me he's like, should I go out to Arizona post show to go to Dylan's seminar so I can go eat food out there? I was like, I don't know if that's a good idea. <laughs> no, it's not because there's lots of good food out here. He'd be screwed. So like a client and friend of mine, and he's three weeks out from his first show, and he's just like sending me food porn nonstop, and I'm like, you might want to stop looking at food porn dude well and and not to mention i'm like i'm like looking at it massing i'm like eh, maybe this one yeah isn't he's good. sending me all this just horrendous Fucking cheese stuff. he's like i'm gonna eat this and i'm like that's the most disgusting thing you've ever i've ever seen why are you sending this to me and i was like i don't know yeah. good. Like, you're just... dieted out of your mind you don't count right now <laughs> wait wait is there a level of cheese that is gross because i think there is personally i think there is my wife doesn't so I'm uh, I'm not the right person to ask because I'm not a big cheese person in general. Oh, okay. I'm not either. Yeah, I'm not. I do like some cheese here and there. But like when someone's like pouring cheese, cheese onto a burger, I'm like, eh, I miss it. So I don't do – so I don't put cheese on a burger ever. Um, I'm a pure, I'm a purist. I don't do that. And um, when it comes to cheeses, it's really the Italian cheeses. So mozzarella, Parmesan. Um, That's the uh, only thing I like mozzarella parm yeah uh burrata of course yeah. uh feta cheese is fine in the right context like feta cheese on a salad yeah um a little bit of fruit yeah that feta might be is... i mean like the top ones that come to mind the macros me. on parm and feta if, if i'm not mistaken are pretty good they're not awful right they're no. lower fat protein than other cheeses yeah um harder cheeses generally are um, yeah, yeah. yeah, I agree with Shimmy. Um, Italian cheese guy, I don't really put like I'll eat a cheeseburger, but if I'm ordering one or making one, I'm not gonna put cheese on it. Let me ask you guys, what's your stance on hot dogs? You like them? I love let's go, let's go. Fuck all of this, let's go. <laughs> okay. If you eat boiled hot dogs. <laughs> think they're good your food opinions are officially invalid <laughs> Generally hot dogs are meats. grilled they get a little scorch going on them you get some burn marks on them get a little crispy outer layer that is how you eat a hot dog or you'll bake it in the oven right or no the same thing yeah you bake it in the oven so it gets kind yeah. of like crispy in your skin going anything where you get some char on it you ever had a low fat hot dog are they good 
bad. I've never had them, but I know they make them. They're not bad. Yeah, I think if you were dieting, I know I've, you guys have probably done this before, but like the the some of like the apple sausages and stuff can be a little more macro friendly. Not, I know this is not hot dogs, but uh, I've had like straight up low fat hot dogs though. They were like two grams of fat per hot dog with like nine huh. grams of protein. Not bad. Let me ask you this: What are your toppings on said hot dog? This is this is it. This is what separates the men from the boys. Okay, if I were to just hot dog, like all out, I'm having spicy pickle relish. Okay. Stone ground mustard. Hold on. I love the specific topping. Like it's not just just. Dylan, give, give us yours while we're waiting for Trevor. Oh, I'm basic. Uh, ketchup, mustard, relish, maybe some onion. What kind of mustard? I mean, I like stone ground mustard. I would go with any mustard that's available. I'm not like picky at all. I'm okay. lame. Okay, lame. fine, Dylan. I mean, Trevor, let's go. Okay, <laughs> spicy relish, stone ground mustard, sautéed or grilled onions. My man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Honestly, I'd probably be fine with that. Maybe some uh, some pickled uh, jalapenos. You didn't say ketchup and mustard. Or you I, didn't I'm say not going to have ketchup on it. Oh. Stone ground mustard. Okay. Here's mine. Ketchup, the basic mustard, like the regular yellow mustard. This is one of the only times that I like this, like prefer this kind, just basic barbecue at someone's house mustard. Uh, sweet relish, fried onions, Sauerkraut. Mm. Sauerkraut. I've done that recently. That was really good. You're right. Yeah. And then I want to sprinkle my own cayenne pepper on the top. Oh, that's pretty good. Bring um, your uh, your seasoning to the cookout. I would. <laughs> so uh, uh, look, I, I I do love a good uh, chili dog. I don't really like. I was going to ask you about chili. that. Um. So I want to just before we get in this, I want to tell you. One of my um, OG fat ass stories of the meals I would eat. So I would take frozen tombstone pizzas, like a pepperoni pizza, slice hot dogs up on it to top it, top it with a can of chili, and then cheese on top of that. Who gave you this idea? My dad. <laughs> Does your dad still do this? Uh, occasionally. Is he very fat? My dad is like 140 pounds. I love oh, that it. sucks. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Both my parents are pretty skinny. Yeah, that sounds revolting. Yeah, I was a fat ass, but I would eat that at least once a week because I would wow. eat the, at least five times a week. Wow. But my, my go-to dinner was a frozen pizza. And then I would always have dessert of either a pint of ice cream or about a fourth of a cake. What kind of cake? On that. Generally, like just chocolate, triple chocolate cake or something from Walmart. All right. So I'm going to give another one out there. This doesn't really, I don't even know why I'm giving this recommendation, but um, Pepperidge Farm cakes in the freezer are very underrated. Very. Huh. Never had a oh, you, I don't, I don't know if I should tell you to have it or not, but they're <laughs> very good. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and get it and have like a fourth of it right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're very good and they go in the freezer, so they're not going to go bad. <laughs> I'm going to have to try that. What's the mm -hmm. best frozen pizza? I don't do frozen pizza, so. Pizza. I, I think the I'm best frozen pizza is called Fresca. Fresca. I had a Giorno the other night and I thought it was pretty good, but. The know. Giorno's is disgusting. Really? Come on, Dan. Come on. Bro, they have like the, the thick crust on it. It was good. Guys, everyone tuning in here, like, yo, Dylan needs money. Dylan DiGiorno needs more clients. Let him coach you so he doesn't have to eat DiGiorno frozen pizzas. Like, <laughs> this is an abomination. Come my on, girlfriend man. buys them, in my defense. She buys them when I eat. bottom tier frozen pizza. Oh, okay. Like, hard, like, Rest get Walmart to brand frozen pizza. It's a thousand times better than DiGiorno. Really? Wow. Yes. I would have not expected that. Dylan, That's I think you I think for your next YouTube video, which you haven't done in a little while, I think you should just buy all the frozen pizzas in your in your uh grocery store and just like video yourself tasting them all. That would that. probably do very well. I yeah. Do that. I'm gonna write that down. 
Yeah, I think that's something that you should do. Or or not well, all of them, but buy like five. Yeah, well, the reason why I do, that's my reference for good pizza is I don't eat pizza ever, so. I know, we've had this conversation and I still think you're weird. You are well, weird. Why don't you I've eat had, pizza? I've had Costco pizza. I've, I've had a little, a little bit this offseason. I've had Costco pizza and I've had DiGiorno. That's I'm it. proud of you. The last time I talked to Dylan about this, he's like, oh yeah, I hadn't eaten pizza in like three years. Trevor changed my mind and I had some pizza. Good. It's not his life, Dylan. You need to get some pizza. I had a positive effect on your life, Dylan. I really am. Thank you. Yeah, Dylan, you need to start having pizza in your post-workout meal. It's very important. Fresca. Okay, so I'm adding Fresca. If you guys have other pizza recommendations for me to try to pick up for this video, I will. <laughs> All right, well, now that this podcast is dissolved into us bullshitting. Yeah. yeah. You guys got oh. enough information already, all right? Let us just live our lives. Oh, hey, this is very <laughs> valuable information, okay? As you can see, well, I'm People very need to know what kind of frozen pizzas they need to buy. A thousand percent. And how to eat their hot dogs. A thousand percent. Yeah, yeah. Um, Slotted for next time. Yeah. And again, if you, if you eat boiled hot dogs, just your food recommendations do not count, so... If you're going to give us food recommendations, you better let us know if you eat both hot dogs first. I okay, don't know if I can what, trust you. I this just popped in my head. Um, just one last question. Trevor, what's <laughs> the whitest food that you eat? Jimmy, maybe if you have some really white foods you eat. but Whitest food I eat? Okay, I'll give you mine. Whitest? Like in... Ethnicity. Like... Yeah, give me yours. I don't even know what you mean. I didn't know this was a thing, and then I realized it was a thing. I used to eat peas and mayo. Apparently, it's a white food. That's disgusting. Yeah. I used to love that shit, by the way. Wait, I lost you guys. What is your deal? The whitest food I eat. Wonder Bread garlic toast. Oh, that is the shit. That is the shit. I used Very to do light. that all the time. I would do mayo and like garlic salt and then put it in like the oven or the, the, the toaster oven. I don't know the whitest food that I eat. Mat matzo ball soup? I don't know. Shimmy, Shimmy is too uppity for that shit. I'm definitely too uppity for that. Definitely. Yeah. I'm not going to let that peasant food touch me. Well, 100%. Fried Spam. A, I've never had it? Spam. Never got it. Delicious. Fried Spam. Fried sp that was very popular when I was growing up, and I hadn't tried it. Uh, it yeah, Fried I, Spam. I spam. Potatoes. Peanut butter and jelly sandwich. That's Fried pretty choice. white. Yeah, but it's still like kind of like grilled. I have delicious. That's delicious. What I didn't hear him. Grilled peanut butter and jelly. No, nope. don't like it. Don't like when my peanut butter gets hot. Uh, you you ever like make a fancy in... one? No, I don't make a fancy one, but I don't like when peanut butter gets hot and then it gets all like it, it's not thick anymore and then it sticks to the roof of your mouth and you get the like. I don't like that. That's what all peanut butter does, Shimmy. No, peanut butter that's regular just knows me and it just like coats my mouth in a perfect way and then that's it. Peanut butter is my favorite food. So, um, and peanut butter and jelly sandwich is one of my favorite things ever. You take okay. two tablespoons of peanut butter because that's what a serving is. You go one to one and a half tablespoons of either strawberry jelly, raspberry jelly, fig jam, or apple jelly. I don't do grape because I don't do white people food. And then I sprinkle chunky salt in the sandwich because it balances out the sweetness of the peanut butter and the jelly and i don't cut the crusts off uh do you do you use wonder bread no <laughs> okay where do you use okay. this is no a white person sandwich that's correct <laughs> I'm, um, I'm all for sourdough peanut butter jelly that's my actually one. Yeah, i honestly like peanut butter jelly on anything man like i don't yeah. care wonder bread peanut butter jelly is amazing peanut butter jelly on a bagel is great like sourdough even whole wheat bread brioche is the top obviously 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 let me give you one more white food that shimmy just brought to my mind that i love mcdonald's sausage biscuit with grape jelly never had it Ooh, delicious that sounds good but i've heard of this i've just never had it delicious sausage biscuit with grape jelly go get yourself go get you one tomorrow morning Trevor, you're definitely the kind of person that thinks grape jelly is the best jelly. Definitely. It is not the best jelly. You don't think, I th I would think you would think that. No, I would much rather have um, a preserve or like a marmalade. Like what? 
Strawberry, blueberry, what? Blueberry, if I can find it. Okay. Hands down. I'm with I'm with Jimmy on the fig. I had that uh, Trader Joe's had one recently. I had never had it. It's really good. Actually, what my favorite is. Jam is hella slept on. Yeah. Is pineapple habanero marmalade. Never had it. That's yeah. So as that's have problem. no as has nobody that listens to this podcast no. because you are the only person that's had that. I have like eight different uh pepper jellies currently. I have yeah, a raspberry a... Carolina Reaper. That's that was what I was gonna say. Is that was another one I've tried. Raspberry to Carolina to Reaper. Do you know what a Carolina Reaper is? Oh, that's yeah. fucking hot. Yeah, it's the hottest pepper in the world. Yeah. It's raspberry you... jelly with Carolina Reaper pepper. How do you eat that? Like, how much can you eat of it at once? It's delicious. Like oh, I guess you're not that white because you can have Carolina Reaper jelly. So good. All right. Anyway, this is going off a way <laughs> long need, food tangent. Um, slotted for next podcast. I did want to talk. I've heard some people talk about intensity techniques not being um being suboptimal. I want to just touch on that. Trevor, you had mentioned uh, volumetrics eating. Maybe touching on that, you had a tangent. And then, yep. Jimmy, if you think of anything, you always have great ideas. We will talk about that as well. So. Cool. cool. All right. Cool. Great talking to you guys. Have a great rest Later, of the guys. Day. Later, alligators. Peace.